Well, thank you very much, Dave. And uh, we're continuing with James. For those of you that may be visitors, um, we're looking through the whole of this letter and it's been assigned to me to look at uh, James chapter 2, which is quite a chunk of uh, scripture. Uh, and it's divided in the New International Version, which is the version I've used in preparing it, into two sections. First of all, um, favoritism forbidden, and then the second part is faith and deed. So I'm going to look at those in turn. We believe that the James who wrote this letter um, was James, the brother of Jesus. Um, and... Um, in the first half, as we've seen, is con concerned that, that uh, there should be no favouritism and that the problem that arises where there is favouritism, partiality, discriminating, um, leaning uh, on one, in favour of one person to the, um, to the detriment of another. And wherever it occurs, it causes havoc. If we look back into history, um, Karl Marx saw that... Um, there was a problem in society in that there were the haves and that there were the haves nots in Roman society. There were the patricians who were the nobles and there were the plebeians, the plebs, who were the ones who did everything for them. In medieval society, there were the nobles and the peasants. Uh, in the industrial society that uh, Karl Marx was observing, there were the what he called the owners of the means of production and the workers of the means of production. And um, he was able to observe a class struggle between those who had and those who had not. And his conclusion was that power and wealth, rather than sin, uh, were the cause of the problem. And that the solution was to abolish property and ownership. And that would get rid of partiality and discrimination. And as he saw it, would lead to a fairer society. Of course, it didn't happen uh, we know through 70 years of communism in Russia that that was far from the case, that um, certainly the years of st under Stalin with the gulags, the, um, the bloodletting, the mass executions, the mass deportations, um, the purges, um, that human sin was as bad under the Russian communism communist system as it was under the czars. So in effect... It just exchanged one nobility, if you like, for another. So that was favouritism, partiality in society. But also we see it in families. Um, if it occurs in families, it's a disaster. I remember having a friend when I was at school whose father favoured his younger brother over him. And my friend was always trying to please his father and rather resented his younger brother. If you get it in the school classroom, if there's a teacher's pet, people are really resentful of it. If you get it in the legal system, if there's partiality in courts of law, uh, the law is brought into disrepute. Um, we had a friend who lived for eight years in one of the former Soviet socialist republics in Central Asia, and she and her husband um, had experience of um, bribery and corruption at every level in the police um, in local government, if you wanted to get anything done, you were expected to produce a bribe. And this produced favouritism to those who had the ability to do it, not a, quite apart from the corruption it brought into that uh, society. And above all, partiality and favouritism in a church is so far from the teaching of Jesus that uh, it should never be present. And yet it was happening in the early church. And also happens in churches today. We're probably not always aware that it is happening, but it is easy to gravitate to somebody, I don't know, because they're attractive or in some way we, we, we welcome them in. Maybe they're young and we, we, we don't make so much of a fuss of, of an older person. And I must say the older I get, the more I become sort of conscious of the fact that, you know, even age can make us less attractive for somebody to make a fuss of when you come into church. So in all its shapes and forms, favouritism is to be avoided. Um, James is saying here that showing preference to a person based on wealth or social status of any type is simply not of Christ. And he gives the example in his case of a rich man coming in, everybody making a real fuss of him. Um, and then the poor man who comes in shabbily dressed is treated really shabbily. Um, partiality is totally the contrary of the message of the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New. I was thinking about Ruth and Naomi in the story of 
you know, them coming back from Moab to the land of Israel after they'd lost their husband, their menfolk, the one who in that culture conferred status on them. And they were at the, they were at the bottom of society, and yet the Jewish law um, provided for gleaning so that people who owned fields of corn weren't supposed to reap it to the very edge. It was supposed to leave a few, a few stalks of, uh, of, of, of hay, uh, of, of corn for the, the gleaners to take. So it provided, even in Old Testament law, um, for the orphan, the widows, the fatherless, the, the people who were marginalised in society. And of course, Ruth and Naomi were taken under the wing of Boaz, who eventually married Ruth. And, um, and so in the Old Testament, we can see God's will being worked out in that way. No favouritism. He is the, the God of the, of the poor and the humble. And... Um, of course, supremely in the teachings of Jesus and Jesus' own life. It's interesting that Jesus, when he came to this earth, didn't come um, as a prince like Abraham or Muhammad or, or as an intellectual. He came as a village tradesman, a carpenter, and he lived among us and he was at the bottom of society. And he spent his time and his ministry with the poor and the marginalized and he had time for women, and I don't mean that in a sexist way, because they were um, sidelined, and yet Jesus spent time with them. Children, prostitutes, we don't know why they may have ended up in prostitution, but he spent time with them. Uh, tax collectors, sinners, people of questionable lifestyle, he had time for. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, Paul Moving from James now to the letters of St. Paul. Paul says this, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. It's actually interesting, uh, whilst I was researching this sermon and uh, reading various things, I uh, came across this lady who's going to appear on the screen, we hope. Selina, quite an unusual name for an 18th century lady, isn't it? But Selina, Countess of Huntingdon. And she said that she was saved by the letter M. She was soundly converted during the evangelical revival of the 18th century. She was a great friend of John Wesley and George Whitfield, at least during the first part of their ministry. I think at one stage she banned um, John Wesley from her pulpits because he wasn't quite Calvinist enough for her. But she spent an awful lot of money on, I suppose, getting the evangelical revival on the, on the road. She she built, or she had built, 64 chapels. She started a Bible college, and she just spent her money on the Lord's work. And uh, George Whitfield described her as being a flame for Jesus. She was so on fire for the Lord. And yet she was a member of the nobility. She was a peeress. And um, so she said that she was saved by the letter M, because Paul didn't say, not any, are of, uh, of noble, uh, noble or influential. He just said, not many of you are, meaning that some, there might be a few who were, and she was one of them. And she worked tirelessly for the downtrodden and the poor, seeking to bring others to know Jesus. I was thinking about Jesus because, you know, he principally was concerned with the poor and the fatherless. He came to bring the good news to the poor, and yet he always had time for those who were further up the social pecking order. When Nicodemus, who was a ruler, of, well, a leader of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, when he came to Jesus at night time, Jesus spent a long time conversing with him because he came not with an agenda, but he came in his need, wanting to know about the kingdom of God. Um, others that spring to mind, the Roman centurion, apparently the rank of centurion was probably around about the rank of captain. It's very difficult to know because the, armed, the, the army was so different then to what it is now, but probably somewhere between uh, captain and lieutenant colonel. So he was 
God is a way up the pecking order, and yet he came as a Gentile to Jesus in his need, wanting, his, wanting Jesus' help for his servant, and Jesus healed his servant. Jairus was another example. He was a leader of the synagogue, and yet he came with his little girl, his daughter, who was close to death, and Jesus healed her. He came to people in their need, uh, whatever their, state, their position in society. I was thinking about the... New Testament after the Gospels and Lydia in the Acts of the Apostles, I think it's chapter 16, she was a lady who was quite well up in the social order. She was a trader um, in purple cloth, which was a very expensive commodity, and yet she gave her heart to the Lord and she opened her house to the, the church and she welcomed St. Paul in. And she was somebody, she was probably somebody similar to the Countess of Huntingdon and certainly supremely, I suppose, in our own time, the Queen. You can't get further up the pecking order than the Queen. And yet what an amazing Christian lady she is, how she has quietly, in a very unassuming way, let it be known that she does trust in Jesus. And I always look forward to her Christmas speech because it seems to get more Christian year on year on year so bless the queen so jesus has time for all these people whoever they are and uh, that's probably a comfort to us in the you know the times in which we live so the reality is that everyone within the church is a sinner saved by grace uh, my late father-in-law charles used to sometimes speak about a school trip he took to the eastern mediterranean by ship where at one point the ship docked and uh, they went into a little church somewhere near Ephesus and everybody took communion, he said, from the ship's captain to the children on the school trip to the Turkish shepherd boy and the teachers and everybody was levelled by the fact of the communion rail and kneeling before the Lord. The Lord's table is a kind of place where we, we realise that we are all the same. Uh, there should be no favouritism, no preference and certainly it was demonstrated there. In this world in which we live, there will be lording it one over another because it's the way that society is set up. It's the way of the world, but it's not the way of Christ. So that's the, uh, the first half, and it just ends with a little snippet of scripture. Uh, Mercy triumphs over judgment, says James. In other words, we are to be merciful and not judgmental. We are to be kindly and... Um, I think it's probably summed up in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, that memory passage that some of us will have learnt in Sunday school. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we then move on to the second half of the chapter, which is concerned with faith and deeds. And at first sight, this may seem completely contradictory to the teachings of St. Paul, also of Martin Luther, and of the Protestant Reformation in general, and um, for that matter, John and Charles Wesley. Um, because, of course, we've been brought up on it, if we've been brought up in the Protestant tradition, that it's not salvation by works, but rather by faith. You can't earn your salvation with good works. You can't, as the medieval church was trying to do, go along with your money and purchase an indulgence. Um, you know, it's a total free gift of Christ based on what he, the only perfect human being that ever lived, uh, that, what he's done for us. And we either accept Christ and the gift that he's given us, um, or we reject him. So why is James saying all this business about deeds being dead when Paul says that we're justified by faith and not by works? Well, it's not as contradictory as it looks, and um, each of them is really looking at a different situation, and if we, if we kind of consider that, it all makes sense. For example, suppose a person is a committed atheist but does lots of good works, and there are lots of people in the world at the present time who are like that and uh, I feel quite humbled and shamed by them to be honest because they do far more good works than I feel I do. Um, but that of itself will not justify them before God and that's not to belittle anything that they're doing. 
which is praiseworthy and kind, but it doesn't earn them salvation. And in fact, if they're an atheist or a humanist, they probably wouldn't thank you for su suggesting that it did. Because if they don't believe in God and heaven and that sort of thing, um, you know, it's a different agenda that is impelling them to do the good works that they do do. So Paul is quite correct in saying it is by grace that we're saved, trusting in Christ and him alone for salvation. But here's another example. Suppose a person um, claims to be a Christian because at some time during their lives they went forward at a Billy Graham rally and they said the sinner's prayer and, um, and then they do nothing about it. They, they watch the news on television, um, they see the suffering and poverty in Africa, they see the strife in the Middle East and um, they... Uh, they don't give any money, they don't give of their time, they don't do anything in a practical way to alleviate the suffering. And James is saying that that is dead religion. Or to take a still, another, still further example, the armchair theologian who um, knows Greek and Hebrew, he writes books, he uh, teaches in a theological college, and yet he never does anything to help anyone. And in the time that Jesus was, um, you know, had his ministry, there were plenty of Pharisees and teachers of the law who knew it all intellectually, but stood aloof from the poor and those who were suffering. So we can know it with our minds, um, but unless we actually get our hands dirty, as it were, then it's dead religion. Uh, James says, what good is that sort of faith? Uh, it's like... Well, he says, faith without works is dead, just as a body without a spirit is dead, verse 26. So there's a world of difference between intellectual belief and personal trust in Jesus. Um, it is said that Martin Luther uh, was close friends with another monk, and both of them were equally persuaded of the need for reformation in the church in the early 16th century. Um, it was agreed that Luther would go down into the world and fight the battle there whilst the other monk would remain in his cell praying for the, the success of Luther's labours. And it, the story goes that one night the monk had a dream in which he saw this single reaper engaged in reaping a huge field uh, on his own and the lone reaper turned in the dream and he saw the face of Martin Luther and at that point, he realized he must leave his cell and his prayers and go and offer some practical help. Now, I would hasten to add, we do need to pray. Prayer is so important. It's mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And it's the, if you like, it's the oil that oils the wheels of, of the church and keeps things moving. Uh, and, you know, unless the builder builds, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. We need to bring the Lord into everything that we do but it doesn't um, obviate the need to get in and help in a practical way as well and that's what James really is getting at and James then comes to the end of the passage by giving some real examples of Old Testament characters whose faith was proved by the actions that they took both of which involved sacrifice and risk so Abraham on Mount Moriah was prepared to sacrifice the most precious thing that he had, his son Isaac, to show his trust and obedience to God. And then Rahab the prostitute was considered righteous by God when she sheltered the Hebrew spies and when, as it were, the, the king got to hear about it and sent the almost like the Gestapo of the time, came knocking on the door and she sent them off in the wrong direction. She was in a dreadful dilemma. Um, she, she told a lie, but the spies lived and uh, she avoided torture and, you know, in due course, the Hebrews came in and took Jericho and took the whole of the land that became, that was the promised land, that became their land. So it's difficult, isn't it? There's a kind of moral dilemma that uh, crops up. Um, 
Yeah. The same dilemma, it strikes me, probably faced Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great Christian German theologian of the mid-20th century who gave up the security and safety of the United States to go back to Nazi Germany uh, to suffer with his own people. And um, there he did all he could to oppose the Nazi regime. It's even suggested he may have been implicated in the plot to assassinate Hitler. Again, you may say a very questionable thing, something that possibly we have to put in our spiritual intray uh, for the Lord at some later date. But the fact is that um, Joshua didn't get involved in that question when he was writing his book. James doesn't get bogged down in it when he's writing his letter. Um, and whatever the rights and wrongs may be, these men and women of faith risked what was most precious to them and their very lives because of their trust in God, who is, of course, the Father of our Lord Jesus. And it does say very clearly in Hebrews chapter 11 that it was credited to them, that is, Abraham, Rahab, and a whole string of other Old Testament patriarchs, it was credited to them as righteousness because they lived by faith and, uh, and not by works. So to conclude... Um, Paul, I think, is starting at the very beginning of a Christian's life. He's looking at a person who is becoming a Christian, and he quite rightly says that to become a Christian, it means you have to trust in Christ's sacrifice and that alone for salvation. He says, not by works that no man or no woman should boast. But James begins much later looking at the professing Christian, the person who's perhaps made a Christian commitment some while back. And um, he's saying, in effect, that a man or woman must prove their faith to be genuine by their deeds. So faith does save, and it's the only thing that saves, but deeds are the natural outworking of that faith. And that surely is endorsed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, by their fruit shall you know them. So in conclusion, we're not saved by deeds. We are saved for deeds. And the question for us, I guess, is are we ready to make the sacrifice and take the risks that they took for the sake of the one in whom we trust? Shall we pray? Lord, these are hard and difficult words in one sense. Do help us to live by faith, to trust in you and you alone for our salvation. But do inspire us through the Holy Spirit to do good works so that our lives might be fulfilled and so that we might be vehicles through whom others can come to know you and your love and your kindness and all the good things you want to give them.